pretty sure we were. We, uh, we were both going to college. We were both young college students, freshmen, and we lived in an efficiency apartment, which was just basically one big room with everything except the bedroom and then a little bedroom here. We had three pieces of furniture. We had a television, and I think it was one of those big console, you know, in a big brand, something that it took four people to move. Then we had a bed and we had a dresser. That was all we owned. And so with our first big paycheck as college students married, we decided what's the next piece of furniture that we should buy? And we prayed about it and asked the Lord what he wanted us to do. And, and then we went out and we bought a Nintendo. <laughs> and we sat on the floor and played Nintendo because we didn't have a chair. So we were ready for marriage, as you can tell. But Christy has been a wonderful life partner these last 40 years with me. And, and I'm thinking about the ordination this afternoon and the spouses that will be standing with those who are being ordained. And there's just no way that it's possible to do it without a partnership. And Christy has been that. We have three grown children. And uh, here's a little bit about to show you them. Some of you ask, how can I pray for you? And outside of praying for
important uh, inter international projects, and we're currently in what we call the identity project. And the question we're asking there is, what does it not just mean for us to be American Nazarenes or Canada Nazarenes? What does it mean to be a global Nazarene? Something that would be true about you and us, no matter what language you spoke, no matter what your ethnicity or what your culture may be. And so we've gone back all the way to 1908 and begun to think what was there in the beginning and what continues to be essential Nazarene DNA that makes us uniquely who we are today. That's still going on. We don't have the final just outcomes of that because that's, an, that's a global project with people from every world region working on that. But I did some of my own thinking and tried to figure out, okay, so if you go back to 1908, what, what was it that was true of Nazarenes then that continues to be true today? And I want to just show you a few things that I think are the case. Uh, the first thing we are and have always been, we've always been a people of compassion. Compassion has been at the heart of who Nazarenes have always been. And, and to tell you where that all came from, Phineas Brzee, who I consider to be kind of our founding, founding father, he, he often made the statement, the mission of the Church of the Nazarene is first to spread scriptural holiness throughout the land. That's something that we all know about the Church of the Nazarene is our emphasis and our belief in the doctrine of holiness that it's not only possible to be entirely sanctified, but it's possible for it to happen now, in this moment, not one day when we get to heaven, not when we achieve sainthood, you know, in, in, in heaven, but something that any consecrated Christian can surrender fully to the Lord and have a pure heart and perfect love. We knew that was essential to the Nazarenes, but what you may not know was the second thing that Brzee said was the mission of the Church of the Nazarene, and that was to work with and among the poor. And, and Brzee said something there that I think hadn't been said maybe since Wesley before him, hundreds of years before, and that was that working with people who may be pushed to the side or the margins or the outcasts, fallen through the cracks, however you want to say that, poor doesn't just mean in poverty, poor might just mean marginalized people in general, but, but that they become a sense of a means of grace to us so that compassion is not just us feeling sorry for someone because they don't have what we have, but it's actually knowing that God is going to do something in our lives by the way that we have relationship with people who live on the margins. You know, the entire Church of the Nazarene name was to say, how can we identify with people from a place where nobody wants to be from? The, the, uh, the Nazareth people of the world. And this continues to be at the forefront of the Church of the Nazarene. Next slide is just an example of what you're doing through Nazarene Compassionate Ministries. If you want to know how global missions really does our work in places where the church is not yet, it begins with NCM. NCM is moving into countries where we even don't have established churches, but through compassion, it's opening doors for us to, be, uh, to begin to plant churches in countries where we're not yet there. Syria and Turkey is one of the most recent projects. You know that uh, two earthquakes that took place in both of them. We don't have official churches in Turkey, but we do have in Syria and in the capital city of Aleppo. And through Nazarene Compassionate Ministries, the church is, is giving uh, lots of aid and lots of compassion to people all throughout the city because of your generosity. The other thing that we've always been since 1908, we've been a people who believe in education. And by education, I'm not just talking about primary schools, I'm not just referring to grade schools. Obviously, we believe that education for children on up is important, but I'm talking about these are, these are institutions of higher education, not only universities, but uh, Bible colleges and, and training centers for pastors. We have 52 
Nazarene institutions of higher education around the world. So you know about Olivet, and you know about NBC, you know about NTS, but you may not know that we have universities, uh, large universities in other parts of the world as well. And we have from the beginning believed that our mission was not just to, to save people's souls, but to also uh, bring help to their bodies through compassion and to raise their minds uh, to be spirit-led people to be flourishing in the places in which they live. We believe that when people receive an education, they're given opportunities to be able to be salt and light in the world in ways that perhaps they could not have been otherwise. So we care deeply about, edu we th in fact, I'd go as far as to say places like Olivet are part of the plan for Nazarene discipleship of our young adults. That's a, that's a part of how we think about the ways we want our educational institutions to be part of discipleship. Next slide. This is something that's always been true of us. We've always believed in the importance of youth and children. We, that seems like an obvious statement, but you should know that not all denominations put an emphasis there. And not only that, in many parts of the world, children especially are not valued and not even counted in churches that because until they become an adult, they're not like helpful. I'm not sure all the reasons for that. But, but Nazarenes are emphasizing, even in cultures where children are not valued, the importance of discipleship from a very early age. I think you're aware of the fact that, that in the USA, 85% of people today who are Christians in the United States became a Christian before the age of 18. 85%. That's a staggering number. And the number goes, in those over 30 who become Christians, I think it's something like 5%. 5% of people become a Christian in the United States after the age of 30. So we, we want to begin very early with our children, vacation Bible school, Sunday school, uh, caravans, whatever it is that you can do to help holiness discipleship to become to begin to help our children to be uh, directed by scripture and by the church instead of just adapting to culture, that's part of the way we disciple our children. This next picture is a fun one for me. This is Christy and I deep in the Amazon jungle. We had been going down the Amazon River for about three or four hours. We were lost in some tributary somewhere in the middle of the jungle, and we our boat came up, it hit the sandbar, and we stepped out on the sand and walked into the jungle, and there was a child development center sponsored by the Church of the Nazarene in the middle of nowhere. And, and here's some of the children that we had a chance to interact with. Again, everywhere you go, children and youth are emphasized in the Church of the Nazarene. It's amazing to me, it, people say, you know, we're losing this generation. If you believe that's actually true, did, did you know that not everything you read on Facebook is true? <laughs> Just want to be sure you knew that. If, if you think we're losing a generation, you should have seen 10,000 students at NYC just from USA and Canada, 10,000 students. And I think your district, uh, what did we have, Tim, from NYC, go to NYC? I think it was 48, 49, somewhere in that so, uh, so 150, ministerially speaking, uh, <laughs> went to NYC. And that probably didn't include the sponsors, right? No, there was 48 sponsors. I knew that exactly. Okay, all right. So, so thank God for the emphasis with youth and children. The other thing we've always believed in that's been a part of Nazarene identity is missions. And you'll notice I, I messed up on this slide. I didn't mean to say mission because we all have a mission that's common, and that's to make Christ-like disciples in the nations. That ought to be the mission statement of every church of the Nazarene around the world. I mean, you can add your own if you want, but it's pretty clear we all have a mission. But missions is what I meant to say with an S because missions is different than the mission. Missions is specifically that enterprise of the church designated to go where the church is not yet, and to reach unreached people groups, uh, to go into all the world. And so we have called missionaries. We have a global missions department in the Church of the Nazarene. And we have had from the beginning. 
Next slide is one of my favorite archive pictures. This is Dr. H.F. Reynolds, one of our first two general superintendents, who was really responsible for the missions initiatives in the early days, going to India, going to Cape Verde, going to Swaziland, going to China. Those were early places where we went as missionaries in the Church of the Nazarene. Here he is, I think this is about 1911 or 1912, I don't know for sure, but he's traveling the back roads of India in some kind of an ox cart. I will never again complain about a 10-hour van ride <laughs> if this is the way general superintendents used to travel. So this, this is how important it was to Reynolds. In fact, J.B. Chapman, his very first missionary kind of trip, tour, he was gone 10 months, 10 months in a row, because in that day you had to travel by boat and train, and, and, but you, you weren't flying around. And so that was the commitment that general superintendents were making to missions in the early days. Next slide. This is an important picture to me. Uh, be, this is, I'm a general superintendent there. May, I'm the one with the dark hair. And uh, so that was a few years ago. To my right is Dr. Philly Chambo. At the time, he was Africa Regional Director. Now he's another one of our general superintendents. At the far side is the FSC, Field Strategy Coordinator, for, for that part, the Portuguese-speaking part of Africa, and then one of the district superintendents in Cape Verde. But in the middle, that's the person I want to emphasize. That is the president of Cape Verde, the country. It could be... I think they now call themselves Cabo Verde, and, but Cape Verde, the Nazarenes have been there more than 100 years. There's 100,000 Nazarenes in Cape Verde, the country, and it's not a big country. The reason I'm in this place with the president is he heard I was coming into the country, and he said he gave me an invitation to come to their White House. Now, he's not a Nazarene, and my assumption is he's a Christian, but I don't even know that for sure. The reason he wanted me to come is he said, I want to personally thank you for the impact the Nazarenes have had on my country. He said, when you came to our country more than 100 years ago, you came in Nazarene missionary boats. It was the only way you could come here. And our country was chaotic, and, and we, we didn't have direction. But he said, not only did you bring hope through the church, he, was, he wasn't using our language, but he said hope through the church but you also brought us a way to live, and we have organized our society around what those early Nazarene missionary boat people offered to us. In fact, the next slide, he then reached out his hand and gave me this coin. He said, this is a common coin for us in Cape Verde. This is as common as your quarter. Every Cape Verdean has one of these in their pocket, and he said, to commemorate and honor the coming of the Church of the Nazarene to our country, we have put on the back of this coin the Nazarene missionary boat to remind the people of the impact of your, of your church. I thought that was a pretty cool thing. That's, it's been true of us from the beginning. We're always thinking about, about people out away from us. Now, next slide. We still commission missionaries. This is Dr. Gustavo Crocker and one of our general superintendents, and here he is commissioning new uh, global missionaries for the Church of the Nazarene from our general board in February of this past year. A couple of things I want you to see about this. First of all, Dr. Crocker is from Guatemala. The others on our board, we have one from Cape Verde, we have one from Mozambique, we have one that was born in Germany, and we have two from the United States. Our newest elected uh, general superintendent, we have our very first South American who is from Colombia, Dr. Christian Sarmiento. You know, Dr. Scott Daniels was also elected. But I, I show you this because the board of general superintendents ourselves reflect the diversity of the church. There's no mandate from the, you know, the, the manual that says you have to elect people from around the world to be general superintendents, but that's what the church has decided to do. This group of missionaries, the reason I show you their picture as they're being prayed for, every single one of them are from somewhere else besides USA and Canada. We still send a number of people, commission them from USA and Canada to be missionaries, but more and more and more, in fact, more than 50% of our missionaries now are being commissioned from other world areas. 
And guess what? Some of them are coming as missionaries to the United States. How many of you know we need missionaries in the United States? And I'm going to guess here, but I'm going to say five to six different languages are spoken here by, by this group. By the way, I, I bring two language, languages to the Board of General Superintendents. I'm fluent in English and Oklahoman, but that's another, <laughs> that's another thing. But I think that's an answer to our prayers, is that we, this is the kind of church we hoped and prayed we would be when we put our focus on missions. Next slide. This is a picture of the 1928 General Board. And there's some very distinguished Nazarene leaders in this picture. I know they look unhappy, but I think they were happy on the inside. Uh, Dr. J.B. Chapman is on the front row, second from the right. Uh, a few over is Dr. Reynolds. He's right in the middle. And then Dr. Goodwin, another general superintendent. And R.T. Williams is next to him. So that's a pretty distinguished group of Nazarene people. Now I want you to see a picture of the current 2023 general board. Not only the difference in the number, but also the diversity, men and women, also uh, people from every region of the world. Put them side by side and you'll get a picture here of what, it, what it's, has happened to our church over these last uh, number of years. I think that's to the glory of God. And then another thing that's been important to us from the beginning is women in ministry. You may think that the Church of the Nazarene is doing it now because it might be a trendy thing, but actually not. It's, it's always been in the DNA of our church. You may not be aware of this, but in 1908, when the Church of the Nazarene merged three denominations into one at Pilot Point, there were actually closer to 20 holiness denominations in the country that Brazil was talking to. And they were all wanting to merge to strengthen their holiness presence in the United States. So why did only three choose to merge while 17 chose not to? There was a variety of reasons, including a few theological reasons. But, but one of the big reasons that three came together was because of their emphasis and priority to say that we believe both women and men are called by God to be set apart to preach the gospel. And so this next picture hangs in my office in Kansas City. This, this is, it says, women preachers in attendance at the General Assembly Church of the Nazarene, Columbus, Ohio, and it says June 13 through 26, 1928. So 1928, this was the women clergy that had gathered. And I don't know why they look happier than the general board did, but they... <laughs> I've never really counted how many are there, but I'm guessing there's maybe 50 to 60 women who were there just at the General Assembly. It's always been a part of who we are. The next slide is an important one to me. This is me uh, in Armenia two years ago, not Wesleyan Arminius, Arminian, but Armenia, the country. And the person behind me is Jim Ritchie. He is the regional director for Eurasia. He's from Scotland. He's a tremendous leader. The person to the far side is Trino Jara, and Trino is the field strategy coordinator for Northern Europe and also the district superintendent for Armenia. And the two women in the middle, I had the privilege of ordaining when I was there. They are the first two women to be ordained in the Church of the Nazarene in Armenia. But not only that, they are the first two women to be ordained into any church in the country of Armenia. And the reason that's important, I mean, it's very easy for us to kind of get kind of tunnel vision and think that, you know, the social issues that we deal with here in North America and Western Europe, maybe that that's the main issues. But when we're talking about doctrinal issues for the Church of the Nazarene. We're not just talking about this and this and this. We're also talking about 
uh, emphasizing women in ministry. I was just with them last year again, and I, I asked them, how was this year for you? And they said, this was a really hard year. Uh, it's been filled with a lot of rejection. We've been asked to leave a lot of meetings uh, you know, other than, uh, with other church leaders and because we're just not welcome in those places. And I, we prayed for them in their district assembly, and we just said to them, when you're pioneers, you, you, have to, you have to navigate some rough waters for those who are coming behind you. But I said, thank you for being pioneer women, women in ministry in your country. Next slide has something to do with women in ministry, but also has to do with something else. This is Maria Tomas. I ordained her in, in Brazil a, a few years ago. And when I ordained her, she was 90 years old. I, I, so just in case you were thinking I'm too old to follow the will of God for my life, <laughs> you go, go talk to, to Maria Tomas about that. I just saw her son at General Assembly. He's the district superintendent there. And he says, my mom's doing really, really well. She's still leading in her church. She's like 94, 95 years old now. But Maria Tomas, the oldest person that in my ministry to, to ordain. Next slide, Ukraine. The last two years, I've been privileged to be the, region, the, the jurisdictional general superintendent for all of Eurasia. Eurasia is a massive region of the world. It includes not only all of Europe, it includes the Middle East, it includes India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, uh, and it's just massive in geography and diversity. But it also includes Russia and includes Ukraine. We have two districts uh, in the Church of the Nazarene in Russia, and we have one district in Ukraine. And you can imagine in the year and a half since we've been uh, in this war that it's put tension even on the church. The next slide is me uh, conducting a Zoom district assembly because obviously I couldn't go there and they couldn't, they couldn't gather. This is the Ukraine district assembly on Zoom. This was a few months ago. And I'm going to say there were probably about 30 or 40 people on that call. And the reality of what they're dealing with in Ukraine was striking to me because the very first thing we did in this assembly was we prayed for one of our Nazarene boys who had died in a battle that week, and his mother was on this call. So we prayed for her, and as the, that Nazarene church was grieving, the other thing was, about 30 minutes into this assembly, uh, a, an air raid siren went off at one of these Zoom locations, and somebody had to take shelter because of bombing that was going on, had to leave their Zoom room. Just, just a reality, even though it's not on our front page anymore, this is still something that uh, the wars that are happening, not just in Ukraine and Russia, we have wars around the world that are impacting the church, and we need to continue to pray for our church there. But in light of that, this happened. Next slide. Now we're back in Armenia again because Armenia is kind of a, kind of a Switzerland location for Russia and Ukraine. It's a neutral place where some can come. Most of the young men can't come because they can't leave Ukraine because they're, you know, they're having to fight. Uh, but some of the Russians came and a few of the Ukrainians were able to come. The person signing this ordination certificate is one of our Russian district superintendents. The person to his right is another Russian uh, district superintendent. And on the far side is our Kazakhstani district superintendent. And I believe the other person is a district secretary from Russia. There they are signing ordination papers for Russians and Ukrainians. Next slide. This is the ordination where the, for the first time in the year and a half since the war had begun, uh, we had Ukrainians and Russians in the same room, despite the politics, despite the anger, and believe me, there's work to be done of reconciliation, but the Church of Jesus Christ is bigger than politics around the world. Amen. Next slide is a picture of us doing training on Nazarene identity, and Jim Ritchie there is in the front. And my favorite picture here is the, is the next one. This is, this is us on the last day we were there, 
and we went on kind of just a sightseeing day, and we went to an old, old, old cathedral in the mountains, and here we are, Ukrainians, Kazakhstanis, and Russians all together, and we were in the tabernacle area, and one of the Russians reached out, he took my hand, and then he took the hand of a Ukrainian next to him, and the whole circle gathered, uh, holding hands, and began to sing in our own language, How Great Thou Art, just as an, a sign that we are going to get through this together. Pray for Russia and Ukraine. Next slide. This, for me, is what I call a MythBuster slide. There's a, there's a very common narrative going around the church today, and here's what the narrative is. The U.S. and Canada, our big job is to pay the bills for global missions, but, but the real action is outside the USA, the real mission action. And, and that the Church of the Nazarene in USA Canada is, is mainly plateaued and in decline, and we're kind of a dying church, et cetera. But, but we can still write the checks. Have you heard that before? I want you to look at this slide and tell me if that's true. This is 2022, just for the USA Canada Church. So last year, not the, not the rest of the world, 5,219 local churches of the Nazarene in USA Canada 29,078 people came to Christ through a Church of the Nazarene in USA Canada last year. Not only that, 19,116 people joined the church, and we planted 94 new churches. That's, we have 78 districts, so that's more than one per district. And these are not PACs. These are not mission preaching points. These are actual baby churches that were planted by the Church of the Nazarene following a pandemic year. And look at the generosity. More than $64 million was given to global missions efforts by USA Canada. I don't know what you think about that, but that doesn't feel like a dead church to me. Now, let me, let me just say this. Let's, our district superintendent did a good job last night of, of speaking reality in with the good news. So let me give you some reality. Of course we have churches that are plateaued and in decline. Did you know that the average life cycle of any church in the United States is 40 years? The average life cycle. So in all denominations, 40 years is 50% or more of, lo of churches. If your church is over the age of 40, you're already in the minority. So if you're 70, if you're 90, I pastored a church that was over 100 years old. We were seeing the best days that we'd ever seen in, in at, at 105 years old. So here's the thing. Churches do die. Churches do have life cycles. And there are some churches we need to let go to heaven. <laughs> and we need to celebrate what God has done in that life cycle of that church because they've had an impact on the kingdom. And we need to celebrate and throw a party and and have a, have a God-glorifying burial. But churches don't have to die. Churches can reset. Churches can be renewed. Uh, but, but it's going to take a mission recalibration, and it's going to take a fresh moving of the Holy Spirit that we can't just rely on what happened 25 years ago. We need the Spirit to come now and move on our churches now. That's what our DS was talking about yesterday. So we're going to put, we're going to provide re places of renewal and opportunities to be trained for how churches find renewal because your church doesn't have to die. But if you're not renewing, you're going to go through the normal life cycle and you will begin to dwindle, you will begin to plateau, and at some point your church will eventually close your doors. But you don't have to. The other thing is, I want you to see about this, if we're not planting three to four times as many baby churches as we are, we're closing churches, if, if it's a one for one, that's the definition of a plateau. And, and so not only do we need to have, we need to have the two coined emphasis, renewing of local churches and planting baby churches. 
So will you say, well, we tried that before, and we've closed a lot of churches that just didn't make it. Of course you did. That's how church, that's how life cycles work. But what if, what if in the next 10 years, you planted 10 new churches on the SWID district? What if, what if five of the 10 became flourishing churches? Would that be worth it? Of course it would, because that's how, that's how the church continues to work. So, so we don't need one or the other. We need church renewal, and we need church planting, and we go hand in hand on that. Now, the last slide. I, I'm going to go one more, actually. Uh, General Assembly was amazing. And uh, if I think, how many of you were at General Assembly? Raise your hand. Well, wow, that's an amazing. How many of you uh, either were, were at General Assembly or you watched General Assembly online? Now raise your hands. Let's see the whole group. Okay. That's great. It, it was an amazing time. It was 10 days. I was just exhausted when it was over. But I came away saying, thank God that, you know, I, I don't know how you keep it together when you see those flags coming in on the first uh, night of the assembly. I've seen it many times. I still get emotional every time I see it. It's a reminder of me to me that this is the kind of church we want to be. But this video is too. Now, before we show the video, let's hold it for just a second, pause it. Let me give you a context. This is only 30 seconds. But this is a real live district assembly that happened just a couple years ago. This is me in Papua New Guinea. This is not 100 years ago. This is not a movie, you know, like you'd see on television. This is a genuine district assembly in Papua New Guinea. And when you watch it, I think you're just going to be amazed on what kind of a church we really have. And uh, maybe you've never seen a general superintendent greeted this way. I know I got a great gift bag when I came, but I didn't get greeted this way. Uh, take, take a look at this and turn it up, please. Lady Warrior. <laughs> so this is me walking into the picture with the lay on and the backpack. Standing next to me to the right is the district superintendent of this district. The people are singing, thank you for bringing the good news to us. Here's a man waving a spear in my face wearing nothing but a coconut, I might add. But it was his Sunday best coconut. you to see that because this is the kind of church you signed up for when you signed up for the Church of the Nazarene. We are, we are a very diverse church and, and these, I, these may feel like strangers to you, but around the world, I, I just want to tell you, people in every country ask about you. They ask, how is our church in America doing? They think about you. They pray for you. Uh, they, they told me many times, we're so thankful for the U.S. church, for the way that they've enabled us to, to come into the Church of the Nazarene. They kind of see you as the mother church. They watch you on social media, see what you're talking about. And... What does it mean when someone at a place like this walks up to me holding a chicken in their hands, I, this has happened, live chickens, and said, please take this and give this to the World Evangelism Fund? And I said, Christy will put that in her suitcase. <laughs> 
What does it mean when they, when they bring fruits and vegetables and they put it on the altar and they say, we want to give this to global missions around the world? I've had people, I had a person one time bring a live pig on a rope and ask me to take it home with me. <laughs> I talked to somebody at General Assembly from Africa and they talked to me about the challenges they had to be able to come and be with their global family, but they said we weren't going to miss being with our global family, so we sold one of our cows so we could be here. Sometimes I hear people talking about how unfair it is that the United States carries so much of the financial burden for global missions. It is true. We, we have some countries that need to do better and, and do more to contribute to global missions. But you do understand these are different economies. Uh, the, it, it cannot be equal giving, but it must be equal sacrifice. And I'm not saying that to put a guilt trip on you. In fact, I'm trying to say something else. I'm actually trying to say thank you for being the kind of generous district that you are. I know every time you give to Global Missions, to World Evangelism Fund, I know it's coming sacrificially in many ways. And thank you for enabling us to continue to be this kind of a church. But just remember that if everybody is doing what God is asking them to do, that's how we continue to be a holiness church around the world. We are not a perfect church. I think all of us know that. But this is a good church. And God is blessing it. And there are far more good things happening in the Church of the Nazarene right now than there are not. So keep optimistic, continue to be generous, and let's continue to be the church that God has enabled us and called us to be. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together right now and just greet somebody next to you and tell them again, I'm so glad we have a global church. <laughs>